All right, everybody. Well, we are in this last installment of this series talking about the, the Father's love. So if you have your Bibles, I'll invite you to open them, uh, open them up to Luke chapter 15. And we're going to do this last installment of the words of Jesus, the prodigal son parable that he gave us. Okay, so Luke 15. Um, how many people travel? Yes, I do too. I love getting out, love, uh, especially when I get to do it with my family, get around to see uh, the world and places, and it's uh, very uh, educational. Uh, so I love to do it, but I don't like really to do it alone. Now, it's fun sometimes. I, I go out, I do, you know, missions trips and whatnot. I think the most recent one I did was, uh, well, 2019, I went to Togo. I did that for about 10 days, really rich, awesome. I didn't travel my, by myself, but I didn't do, do it with my family. We went with a bunch of pastors and uh, checked out uh, the west coast of Africa there. It was powerful. And then in 2016, I went over to Haiti and did a mission trip over there for about uh, 10 days or so. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, I love to travel. Uh, the fun part is leaving, and the, the better part is coming home. Do you know why? Anytime you're away from home, what do you want the most? Your own bed. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you, you sleep in all kinds of situations. Even if it's a nice hotel, you still something about your own bed. Right? Your own stuff. Being in your own domain. I mean, just I love coming home. So there's nothing quite like home. Uh, it's where I belong. Uh, it's, it's our domain. You know the feeling when you've been gone for a good while and you finally come home. Home is a place that makes you feel calm as soon as you enter the door. Ah, things are where they should be. And a home uh, feels lived in, doesn't it? If it's, if, if, if it's, it's a homey place, if you guys over, uh, go over to the Eblins place, they got a really nice place. I mean, everything's well ordered. The place feels so um, full of character and fun. I think Rick has a great place. Uh, Nancy Askew, saw her earlier. She has a great place. Even her property just makes you feel relaxed, like you're at home. So what are some of the things that make a house a home? I think uh, sleeping, you know? In your own bed makes a house a home. Uh, photographs on the wall, artwork on the wall, a bookshelf filled with your favorite books, uh, your favorite spot on the sofa, a house filled with children, a whole house strewn across with toys. All right? We have, uh, I think we're growing out of the stage, but we have had like constantly for the last 10 years, Nerf bullets all around, <laughs> Legos all around. I mean, that's just typical. Now anymore, we got like dog bones, <laughs> you know, dog toys. Rosie doesn't pick up after herself. So fresh towels make a house a home, clothes all hung up, a nice doormat, a good smell when you come into the house. I mean, what are your, some of your favorite smells in a home? Coffee, right? In the morning, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I love the ambiance of coffee. It just fills out a room. I love, like, you know, baked bread. My wife's been doing up a whole bunch of sourdough lately. Amen. That stuff is so good. It costs you pennies, and yet it tastes so good. It tastes so much better than store-bought stuff, you know? So uh, baked bread, I think uh, bacon and eggs. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Bacon and eggs? Oh, man. And then, uh, then a, a mother makes a good home. I grew up in a great home. And it was my mom. She took such good care of me. She doted on me, waited on me, fed me, discomforted me. My mom was awesome. And I, I, I can tell you, this would have been nice for me, a father, a father. I didn't have my dad around very much, but I think, man, having a dad in the home would have been pretty awesome. What would have that been like to have a father and still have a father to come home to? 
So today, I want to talk about I want to talk about the topic of being at home, being at home with the Father. So Luke 15 uh, records uh, a very famous parable of Jesus. Uh, it was a parable of the lost son. Uh, we've been looking at this now. This is the third week, and we have seen that, uh, that there was not just one lost son, but two, right? One son was gone physically, and then another, go- another son was gone kind of emotionally. He was detached. He was doing the work, but he wasn't really there relationally. And being at home with a father really is the goal of our spiritual journey. Let that sink in. Being at home with the father is the goal of our spiritual journey. So the first week we looked at this parable from the younger son's point of view, um, then from the older son's point of view, and then today we're going to look at, at it from perhaps my favorite point of view, and that's the point of view point of the view of the father, the father. So as we read this parable, uh, I'm going to ask you to close, uh, f- close your eyes, pay attention to the father, imagine, put yourself in the story, because if we're going to be at home with the father, we're going to have to appreciate what he is like. So I want you to hone in, pay attention as we read this parable of Jesus, pay attention to what the Father is doing. Let me pray. Father, this story was given to us by your Son when you were on earth, and you wanted us to understand who you were like. So I'm praying now by the power of your Holy Spirit that was given to us that you would illumine our minds and help us to apprehend your character, your nature, the way you do things, You have a desire for us, and you want to draw us into your love. And I pray that you would do that for your church, for us sitting in this room, that we would become truly at home with the Father. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here are the words of Jesus. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And the father divided the property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country him into his fields to feed pigs and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate no one gave him anything but when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but I perish here with hunger I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him father I have sinned against heaven and, bef- heaven and, uh, and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said to him, your brother has come. 
And your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him, pleaded with him, begged with him. But he answered his father, look. These many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was fitting. It was appropriate to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. And with the story, Jesus says, this is what God is like. Some of us, uh, maybe even many of us, may not have had a good example of what what a good father is like. Um, personally, I didn't get much time with my dad. Uh, he was um, out of that home when I was about two or three years old. And uh, I saw him, I uh, was born in 1970, saw him throughout the 70s. And my feed, right? Okay. Uh, the 70s, I saw him a, a, a few times. Uh, no, the ages I saw him a few times. The 70s, I, I, excuse me. The 2000s, I saw him once. In 2010s, I saw him once. That's not a lot of time with my dad. The funny thing is, uh, when I uh, get a hint of cigarette smoke, it's kind of a sweet smell to me because my dad smoked and uh, my mom didn't. You know, so when I was with my mom, and I loved my mom, but I loved being with my dad as well. Uh, so when I was with him, he smoked. And so it, even today, to, to this day, when I get just a little hint of cigarette smoke, it's kind of a sweet smell a little bit. I don't advise it. <laughs> but because uh, uh, it reminds me of being with this strange and mysterious man I don't know very well. And uh, I think there is this innate desire for us all to have a connection with our father. A lot of us have imperfect dads and dads who may, may not have fulfilled their roles. But every one of us have a perfect dad in God. The perfect father in God. But here's the problem. Without a lot of practice in relating with a father, it might be a little difficult to know how to relate to God as father. The image uh, of the father might not con- uh, you know, conjure up the warmest of feelings, the, mo- the warmest of affections in your heart. Uh, you may have been neglected growing up. You might have been abused. You might have been abandoned. Maybe your dad wasn't emotionally available to you. Uh, maybe you just didn't have a good relationship with your father. But your experience uh, with your natural father uh, does not have to dictate uh, your relationship with God the Father because God is Father. He is perfect in His character, in His nature. That's who He is. And although if you did not have a good father, you can learn how to have a great connection with God because He is perfect. In all of his ways. So the goal of our spiritual journey is to, is to get to a place where we are at home. It's like we started out all the, all the feeling and the ambiance of being at home is awaiting you with a relationship with the Father. Your God, your daddy God. So when we are at home with him, we have arrived in the place that we are destined to be. And to help you uh, trust in him, 
uh, Jesus tells us what he is like. Look at verse 20. Take a, take a good look at verse 20. It says, he arose and came to his father. This is, this, this is the son that wanted out, wanted to do his own thing, wanted nothing to do with the father. When he was a long way off, the father saw him. It means he was on the lookout. He wasn't just doing his own thing somewhere locked into his man cave and wouldn't come out because he was just preoccupied with his own stuff. No, he was awaiting the return of his son. And it says here, he felt compassion, didn't feel anger, didn't, wasn't frustrated, didn't want to just thump him over the head. He had compassion in his heart. One translation says, deep feelings of love. Can you imagine that? God saw him afar, a long way off, and something stirred in his heart. And as a dad, if you've ever been a dad, man, you love your kids. And I can't imagine that kind of love God would have towards you. He sees us, and he has deep feelings of love, and he ran. This was not typical. In Near Eastern uh, culture, man, the, the, the father was dignified. Right? He would never be caught, like, you know, girding his loins and running. I mean, that would, be, uh, that would be below him. But this father, he didn't care. Dignity was thrown to the wind. He had compassion, deep feelings of love in his heart. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. Do you get the this, this sense that this father is emotionally as available to you? Your father might have not have known how to handle feelings and emotions, but this one, he does. He is emotional. Even the older son here, he's outside throwing a fit, and the father comes out to him and is pleading with him and begging earnestly, hands on the shoulders, caring, looking into his eyes, communicating love. This is, this is who God is. Right? He's emotionally available. Is that good news? To have a dad who cares, can identify, can feel what you feel even to a greater extent than even you can. He weeps with you. He laughs with you. He rejoices with you. He, he throws parties. He throws celebrations. This God likes to party. He likes to celebrate. He rejoices over you. He dances. He laughs. He cries. This is the God Jesus wants us to know. So being at home with this emotionally available father is the goal of the spiritual life. Are you able to share your emotions with God? Are you able to sense his connectivity with you? Sometimes it's hard. But this is what we're moving towards, getting to a place. This is God's heart for you, is that you would be at home with the Father and connecting in all cylinders with who He is and He with you. A lot of us aren't there yet, but this is what we're endeavoring towards. This is the, this is the quest. This is the journey. This is the goal, to be at home, not out in the field doing the work, not somewhere else, but literally actually with his, with, with his presence, engaging, loving, talking, listening, being at home. So being at home with the Father is the goal of our spiritual journey. So we need to learn how to be at home. Being at home. So how do we do that? I think it means coming back no matter how many times you fail. You've slipped up. You've done things that you shouldn't have done. You've, you've ventured away. You've ventured out. And you've messed up. You've sinned. But come back home no matter how many times you've done it. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. Because you keep coming, that stuff starts to burn away. That stuff that you are, you are ashamed of and you keep embracing God and experiencing his grace 
and his embrace, his love, his unconditional love. Do you guys know what that means? His love for you is not conditioned. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you no matter what. And if you keep coming back to that love, I'm telling you, those things start to burn and dissipate away. So number one, keep coming back no matter how many times you fail. And then number two, receive his forgiveness. Sometimes you need to ask for forgiveness and just pause. Not rush on, but literally receive his forgiveness. He's given you his best robe. Wear it. He's given you a, a ring for your fingers. Wear it. He's given you sandals for your feet. Wear it. Wear them. Can you imagine what would you, you know, what, 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 would, what would the story be if, if that guy in the story rejected all those gifts and just refused them and says, I can't wear these. I can't wear them. You're wrecking the story. Come on, man. This was intended for you to enjoy. Put it on your shoulders. Put the ring on your finger. Walk around and, and, and carry yourself with dignity. This was, the, this was the whole point of the grace. And yet we do that every time. We walk around in shame and condemnation. You know, the worst thing about sin is the result of sin. It's, it's, it's God's, you know, he, he's setting you free, and yet the enemy has bound you up with this feeling of, I'm not worthy. Who told you that? Father didn't tell you that. So receive the forgiveness. Receive the grace. You know what grace is? We've said it before. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Expense. He, he shed royal blood for you to have that. Don't throw it to the side. He loves you. Keep coming back home and keep receiving his forgiveness. And then number three, I would say practice prayer. Practice prayer. Knowing the Father, relating with the Father, being comfortable with the Father is the only way to be truly at home. Practice talking. Practice listening. Practice spending time in his presence. Reading his word. Just practice relating. That's what prayer is all about. You don't need to be formal. You don't need to be perfect. You don't need to write, use the right words. Just talk. Just talk. Relate. Not being on edge. Sometimes, you know, you don't feel comfortable. In somebody else's presence, somebody else's place, you know, you might be feeling kind of antsy. This comes with being unfamiliar, having to be somebody maybe that you're not, having to prove something, having to, having to make something happen. I hate feeling on edge. I want to feel at home. I, I want to be in the moment. I, I want to know that I mean something and that I'm significant. It's hard to feel fully at home when you don't feel secure. Hello? Am I the only one? I know this is a prevalent issue in humanity. A lot of us deal with this. We don't feel secure. We don't feel worthy. We, we doubt our, our place. We question our purpose. We have deep doubts. And the only antidote to this, the only remedy when it comes to being at home with the Father is prayer. Practicing prayer. Getting comfortable talking, listening. And this is especially pertinent for the older sons, the ones who never have left. Right? They're dutiful and they're out in the field, right? They're doing the work. I think this is, this is key for like pastors. You can kind of feel good about doing the work, right? Doing the work of ministry and you're out in the field. You never really spend time in the presence of the Father. And we can get, really get tripped up thinking that, ah, yeah, I've never left home. I'm 
responsible. I've been in the church for X amount of years. But we don't spend the time relating. Sometimes I can get busy. My weeks are busy, and I try not to be busy. Some people say, oh, you're busy. I try not very hard not to be busy. I don't want to be. It's not a compliment. Because when you're busy, you can get carried away. And, and you're not carried away from the Father. Carried away from being at home. You're just out in the field doing the work. Get in the house. Spend some time with your daddy. Everybody needs a good daddy. Even successful pastors who are doing all kinds of things for the Lord. And we can heap up the admiration and the praise. And yet, they're anemic. They're relationally anemic. They haven't spent that time being at home. So being at home with a father, not just in the field, is the goal of our spiritual journey. But our journey, our journey is never complete until we have become like the father for other people. One of my favorite books is uh, called uh, The Return of the Prodigal by Henry Nouwen. Uh, I would highly recommend you look at the book sometime if you haven't already. It's a, it's a beautiful um, description of this parable. And in this book, he points out that we have all been both the younger and the older son, but we are not to remain dependent children all of our lives. You know, I have been the recipient of some great fathers in the faith. Uh, Phil Vance was a great man that took me under his wing. Jay Becker, Kenny Byers, uh, Bill Wilson here even in the network. Rick Ballesta has been a, a, an amazing man in my life, a, a great source of encouragement. But there comes a time that all of us, men and women alike, need to become that person for other people. And we can only be that when we have received that. But if we're always in the receiving position, then I think something is missing. Over the last, I don't know, how long has it been? Six, seven, eight months now? Gotten to know Brett Smith over here? Great man. He, he's just growing. He's fresh. He's just, I love hearing the man pray. He's just so real, Right? And uh, he told me one time, man, just so earnestly, he told me, man, Demetrius, I want to be the shepherd. I don't, I, don't, I don't always want to be the sheep. I want to be the shepherd. There was this, like, longing, yearning to, to, to step into what God has made him to be. You know, we're always, we're going to always be the sheep, right? But if we're only the sheep, then something's missing, we got to step into also being the shepherd. We need to be the father. We need to be somebody who, who comes in and, and is that for other people. Not just always being the older brother and the younger brother and the older brother. And, you know, and it's oscillated between the brothers. Someday we got to take our own place within the house. And be at home enough to be the father for somebody else. It's a conscious step, and quite honestly, a lonely step. You know what I mean? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Trying to be that person for somebody else guarantees you nothing in return. Look at what the father got out of this whole exchange. Did he get anything other than pain? <laughs> No, he didn't receive a lot in return, but he gave out all that he had. There is no promise that when you do this for somebody else, that the love is going to be reciprocated. Henry Nouwen says in this book, uh, I have to dare to stretch out my hands to people as the Father, regardless of how they feel or think about me. Sometimes we're, we're, we're apt to kind of pull back. If somebody's pulling back from you, you want to pull back from them. But to keep reaching out and to keep stretching out, keep opening up your, 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 your life, your heart 
makes you very vulnerable because there's no guarantees you're going to ever get anything back. Living out of this spiritual fatherhood requires a radical discipline of being at home. And only when you're at home can you reach out your hands to somebody else and receive them. So this requires being confident, loved, secure, relaxed. You've got to be comfortable in your own skin. Uh, You've got to know who you are. Your needs need to be satisfied so that you can tend to the needs of other people. And you can only do that when you are at home with the Father. So how do we become, how do we become the welcoming Father? How do we do this? I'd say take the first step. Take the first step. Take the initiative in relationships. That's what the father does in both of these cases. He goes out to meet the younger son. He goes out to meet the older son. He's the first to initiate restoration. That's what fathers do. He's the first to make the move. He doesn't doesn't have the luxury to wait on somebody to come to him. He's reaching out his hands. He's taking the first step. Nobody is moving towards him in the story, yet I'm sure his feelings are hurt. And yet, yet that's not the most important thing for him. If I'm to become the father, I got to get over myself. I got to get over my feelings. Oftentimes, the source of love is the source of suffering. And in the story, this father suffered. But we are able to do this because we have been with the Father long enough that He's filling us up to the full and we could just, out of the overflow of that love, give it unconditionally to those in need. So number one, becoming, wel- becoming the welcoming Father is taking the first step. And I would say uh, giving others the final say. So you take the first step, and you give others the final say. This is hospitality at its best. You open the door. You make the invite. There's no guarantee who's going to show up. Sometimes, man, nobody shows up. But do you close up shop because nobody ever showed up? No, you keep doing it. You keep opening. This is radical hospitality. This is what God is for us. And when we are at home with him, we can do the same thing for other people. Radical hospitality. Opening up your arms and bringing people inside, into your heart. Not just holding people at a distance out here. But you're welcoming, taking, embracing. And it also means you're allowing people to walk away. This is what's called non Demanding love. Do you know that love can be very demanding? Oh, we can put the the greatest demands on people that we love. But to actually experience a sense of non-demanding love, that's the purest kind. That's the wonderful kind of love. There's no demands. My arms, my doors are wide open. Take it or leave it. I will always be here for you, and I'll always make the first move. This is what fathers do. So what does that look like, a non-demanding love? So if you've noticed from the parable, he doesn't speak out of his position as father. As your father, I command you to. He doesn't do that. He doesn't demand. He doesn't force. He doesn't constrain. He doesn't push. He doesn't pull. He doesn't try to convince. It's much easier and safer just to exert your authority. Look here. Be the dictator. But the further you go into fatherhood, the more open-handed one must be. My kids are getting older. I can't dictate to them like I did when, I, when they were like two and three and four. Now I have to switch gears into this way, this this. Influence. I need to be a, a friend who comes alongside and encourages. I will always be a father, but my style of relationship has to change. And so as we grow into this 
personage, I think we need to do the same thing. So if I try to make my children love me, I risk losing my fatherhood. And God is not willing to do that. So being at home with the Father is the goal of our spiritual journey. And our journey is never complete until we become like the Father for other people. So I'm going to close this way. I want us to sit with the Father. I'm going to invite the music team to come on up. I want us to sit with the Father. I want him to put his best robe around your shoulders. All of us have been away from home. Sometimes we wander. Sometimes we stray. We're prone to do that, you know. So in this moment, I want us to sit with the Father. Let him put his best robe, his best robe on your shoulders. Let him put his ring on your finger. Let him put his sandals on your feet. I want you to come home. Now I want you to receive the favor, the blessing, the grace, the riches of God at the expense of Christ Jesus, the true elder brother. And once that's complete, I would like us to stand to our feet, express our love, appreciation to our daddy God who loves us so, so much. Deep feelings of love goes both ways.